So I played the Tribe 9 demo. Hi Cubs, welcome to my first formal review ever. It's going to be all over the place, it's going to be chaotic, but if you enjoy it, let me know in the comments below and maybe it'll come back a little bit more refined, a little less chaotic, though I know y'all are a fan of chaos. Anywho, let's get into it. Tribe 9 is an upcoming game from Tukio Games. It is a gacha game with an action RPG element. The open beta testing for the demo, which was quite hefty, consisting of the prologue and chapter 1, was available from October 14th to October 21st. So by the time this video is posted, the demo will be unavailable pending player feedback ahead of the complete release. A few disclaimers, I did not participate in the closed beta in August 2024, so this is a completely blind playthrough. If you did take part in the closed beta testing in August 2024, as well as the open beta testing in October 2024, please leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought and what kind of quality of life changes were made after feedback was provided to the developers. I'm very aware that this was a demo and things can always change. Feedback via a survey after our first impressions were provided, so take what you see here with a grain of salt as things can always change by the time the full game releases. As far as gacha games go, my experiences with Genshin Impact, which I still actively play today, I may make a lot of references to compare resources throughout this video. Honkai Star Rail is another one, which I did play on and off. I find the turn-based RPG element a little lacking, and the story was kind of getting uh, really political and philosophical, so I was having a really hard time getting my mind around the story. Zenla Zone Zero, which I dropped before the 1.1 patch. The combat was satisfying, however, the character grinding was overwhelming. I also had a hard time with the time-specific event element. Finally, if you know me, you know that I really like the Rampa series, and if you tell me that Team Rampa is making a new game, I will play it. I have played Rampa 1, 2, V3, S, watched both the animation and Donkin Rampa 3. I'm currently playing through Ultra Despair Girls, and I've also played Worlds End Club and Master Detective Archives Ring Code. You can find my playthrough for the latter on my channel. On top of that, I'm looking forward to the 100 Line Last Defense Academy coming out in 2025, which looks like a TRPG from the same team. If I happen to miss any and you have any recommendations, please let me know in the comments below. Tribe 9 takes place in a dystopian future. The year is 20XX, the location, Neo Tokyo. To resolve their conflicts, teams banded together to create groups called tribes and replaced violence with a dueling method similar to baseball called extreme baseball, or they just shortened it to XB. The loser of the XB match must obey the winner. However, types have changed. An unknown force has abolished XB and instated XG, a deadly game with lethal consequences. There are 23 cities and each city has what they call a governing rule. To me, the player, I'm reminded of No Game No Life where there are certain rule sets and if the rules are broken, there are consequences. We do experience the rules and consequences in one city during chapter one and in classic Team Rampa style, there is an execution that takes place. Our party's goal, as far as the player can tell, is they are trying to rid each city of XG and reinstate XB as a form of resolving conflict within each city. Now, when I was starting out, the game was a little confusing because it seemed to be a little bit everywhere. When you wake up as the main protagonist, you're in an 8-bit world, and a few minutes in, he is then rescued by characters with higher resolution sprites. After this cutscene, the exploration does keep that 2.5D Octopath style look, which I find absolutely gorgeous by the way. But then, when you're in battle, full 3D models. This is where the action RPG tutorial kicks in. There's also puzzle elements mixed in as well, and then there was the baseball game, which kind of looked like the argument pieces in Master Detective Archives Rain Code. So needless to say, the prologue was very confusing for me. It does really kind of settle into the genre it wants to be come chapter one, which is an action RPG with 2.5D exploration sprinkled with some puzzle elements to solve how to progress in the overworld. And it does seem like each chapter ends with an extreme baseball conflict. The overworld map is very clearly indicative of where things are. It develops as the story unfolds and each area will have spawns that get stronger than the last and the leveling up system, I love the leveling up system, because it feels so organic. Because it actually feels like a solo action RPG genre where you're not grinding the level up materials with your time refreshing resources. When I say time refreshing resources, I'm referring to resources like resin in Genshin Impact where they are replenished as real life time goes by. Resin was essentially used for dungeons, for tension card upgrades, and artifact farming. Artifacts in Tribe 9 are called compatible monsters. So your characters were organically leveling up and another nice thing was one of the shops gives you food that increases EXP 
XP drops until a certain level. I found this very handy for any new characters that you might be pulling for that you want to be viable as soon as possible during exploration, but still maintain that organic feel of leveling up. Let's touch on the shops next. There's obviously a clinic if ever one of your characters falls in battle. You can always make first aid kits at craft benches if you don't want to walk to the clinic. There's also a daily commission NPC where you can pick up the rewards that you want for up to three commissions. This can be either character EXP, in-game currency, tension card level up currency, and anything else that might come along the line. But it was nice to be able to choose my reward for my three daily commissions. And there's also a food shop, which I mentioned previously. The overworld map will also list any side quests. Key information, main quests, dungeons, checkpoints, they're all indicated with clear symbols. There was also a nice little achievement journal provided by one of the characters that you bump into. So this is similar to the Officer Mew Mew NPC in ZZZ, if you're familiar with it. So every time that you would perform certain requirements, you ended up getting rewards and stamps. And for every stamp quota, you had your level cap increased. I think it equated to every 10 stamps, you got five levels added to your level cap. I think this is a good incentive for players to explore and do combat and things like that. Before we go into combat, let's go over the character screens. Each character will list obviously their stats, what level they're at, what are their passive skills, as well as what are their actions, what happens when you're doing a melee attack. This will either be close combat or long range, and if you click on either of the actions listed, it'll describe what happens. So, kind of gives you an idea what kind of character they are. Are they a DPS unit? Are they a support unit? Healing unit? Things like that. On top of that, you'll notice a little shield on the character's action buttons that depict whether or not it is a deflect option. So every time an enemy attacks and you use that skill at the right time, by the way, you'll manage to do this kind of parry action. And that's what they call a deflect. It's actually very satisfying to see for one. And for two, it helps you bring up your party's tension gauge, which we'll touch on as well. There's another menu for your character's quote unquote talents when comparing to Genshin Impact. The way that you level those up is by ranking up your character. So as they level up and they meet certain milestones, you can rank them up and you end up getting skill points to allocate to either all of their attacks, their survival skills, support skills, or either of their passives. Finally, we have the artifact system, also known as compatible monster. During the demo, I only had access to two different compatible monster sets. I thought this looked really heckin' cute. It reminded me a lot of those Digimon themed Tamagotchi devices and they came in three piece sets. The sets that we have right now, they're either an attack focused one or an HP focused one. So one for your DPS units and one for your support units. You're able to filter by main stat and sub stat which I find is very nice. The leveling up system is similar to Genshin Impact in the way that you need other artifacts to feed your artifacts so that they can level up. Finally, your characters also can transcend, so if you pull doubles, then you can unlock extra stat bonus and skill levels. This is similar to our constellation system in Genshin Impact. Each character does have an element class, which is indicated by a colored symbol, so we have shock, apathy, fear, etc. So that's something to take into consideration when we're building our parties. If you've noticed, there is one symbol that leads to another symbol. That is important because that is going to tell you how you're going to get chain reactions during combat. Don't worry, all these terms will make sense when I'm explaining combat. I didn't really analyze the compatible monsters all that much. All I know is it increased some stats on my characters and I hope for the best during bosses. I'm usually the one that looks up guides for building characters and kind of plan accordingly. I appreciate all the fans and content creators that are really good at analyzing characters and recommending builds because you are the sources that I go to for this kind of stuff and you are doing a great job. Tension cards are your quote unquote weapons. It is equipped to the entire party. So one thing I noticed while I was pulling on the banners, which we'll get to later, is that if you were getting doubles, it was automatically upgrading your tension card. So you would only have one copy of a tension card within your inventory. The number on the top left of the tension card is indicative of what level your tension gauge needs to be for it to be active on top of the other requirements within its description. You'll have a certain currency to level up your tension cards and there are dungeons to explore to get the materials to unlock that level cap. We touched on the character page, we touched on what's important to look for when you're building your party, and we touched on the tension cards and their tension level. So when you're building your party, 
It's a party of three, by the way. You essentially are controlling the character in the first slot. The other two characters are going to be doing their own thing, unless I completely missed that part in the tutorial. Anyway, while I was playing, I only took control of the first slot. <laughs> However, if the other character died, it was at that point I was taking control of a second character. So it might be smart to rotate your characters so that if your main dies, you won't be like totally confused as to how you're supposed to fight these mobs or this boss. So when you're picking your party members, look at what their elements are and what complementary elements they need in their party so that you can perform their chain reactions. If your characters don't synergize together, you're not going to get those bonus actions that will increase your damage output for one and for two, bring up that tension gauge to let you get more buffs from the cards that you have attached to your party. You can have up to five tension cards. For balance, I had a couple level zeros so that I had a couple buffs starting out one level one, one level two, and then one extreme. For one party example that I fell in love with and resonated well together was Kazuki. He is my shock sustaining unit, Yutaka, who is an apathy range DPS unit, and Koishi, who is a healing fear unit. For your tension gauge, it does go up as time passes, but you can accelerate how fast it goes up based on what kind of hits you're landing on the enemy and if you're performing any chain skills with your party members. Now, on the flip side, your enemy can also bring up their tension gauge based on as time passes or if they land certain hits on your party members. Tension gauges will go up if any unfavorable things happen to your party. Once it hits that extreme mark for either side, it will gradually go down as time passes. Sometimes I found myself playing defensive until the enemy cooled their jets. Support party members are completely autonomous. They will do their own thing, but it's up to the player to activate the chain skills, which is indicated by a white flashing circle around the character's avatar, and as well as their ultimates. So you can plan the ultimates to turn the tide in your favor. Ultimates are indicated by the magenta circle that goes over the party member's avatar, and you can gradually see that filling out as the battle progresses. Both chain skills and ultimates have a cooldown time. One thing I noticed is chain skills were refreshed at the end of battle, so I used those as soon as they came up. Ultimate gauges did carry over to the next fight, so if the enemy was near death, I saved the ultimate for the next fight. All in all, I found the combat very smooth. It was a little overwhelming when I got to the tail end of chapter one. Mostly while I was building this party that I ended up falling in love with, it wasn't quite a viable one at the tail end of chapter one. So I was switching out to the starter package party. This to say that the beginner party was a very good option and got me through the majority of the demo. As far as controls, I did try the prologue with mouse and keyboard, and I'm not huge on mouse and keyboard. The mouse is great for, like, aiming and things, but as far as, like, button inputs for combat-oriented games and exploration, I personally don't find it ergonomically friendly, so I opted to do chapter one with a controller, which was significantly smoother for combat. Steam also let me use the mouse for the overworld puzzles, also made it very easy for menuing. I was still able to use the controller for combat, which I am much more familiar with. It goes without saying the controls are different from overworld to combat to extreme baseball. The extreme baseball game plays more like a visual novel and you're just choosing the prompts that would turn the tides in your favor. So for that section, I was using mouse and keyboard because it was a little less challenging dexterity wise. I really appreciate Steam letting me go from one to the other seamlessly for these very different sections of the games that play differently. I see Takeda is going to be composing the music for this game, so I'm really excited because I really like the music for Donkin Rampa and I love the music in Master Detective Archives, so kind of pumped to hear what they compose for this game. There's disclaimers as the game is loading that the musical piece is not final, of course, so we're not going to touch on music too, too much. I'm okay with what they have so far, though it's getting repetitive between each fight so hopefully they'll add a little bit more variety as the game develops and continues um but i will say the music in the extreme baseball game totally a bop I love the UI. The 2.5D exploration segments are gorgeous and the character pages are also quite beautiful and dynamic. The art style, mm, 
I love the variety in character design as far as the Danganronpa series goes. We're very used to seeing the very round, large-eyed teenage characters, but there's a lot of older characters in this game, and you can see the clear differences, and they've definitely refined their art style, but also kept that very unique style that you're used to seeing with this team. As for the extreme baseball segment, yeah, when they say extreme, they mean extreme. Whenever you're getting an out, or you're getting the safe, or you're getting the point, or you're getting the strike out, it is just so satisfying to look at the cutscenes that are beautifully rendered. Thumbs up for graphics and design. Okay, <laughs> so obviously this segment is going to, I would assume, see the most changes after official release. So during the demo, there was three banners. There was the limited character banner, which was Kazuki, the tension card banner, which was his signature weapon, and then there was the standard banner. Now, one thing I notice is, I'm going to say wishing currency is the same for all three. So kind of hoping that it's differentiated between limited and standard because to me, that kind of diminishes the incentive to pull on the standard banner if it's the same currency. During the demo, they were very generous with the amount of gotcha currency, so I was able to pull a variety of characters, and that's when I determined what party I really liked. Also really hoping that the RNG factor just hasn't been programmed properly because I hit hard pity every single time. Anywho, the limited banner does have a 50-50 system, so I lost my 50-50 the first time before I got Kazuki, and the tension banner also has a 50-50 system based on the detail page. I did happen to win my 50-50 and got his weapon card, but apparently, if you don't get the banner tension card, then the next time that you're pulling and you get the high-value tension card, it'll be the one that's on the banner. The rating system is 1, 2, 3... If you're used to seeing three, four, five, it's one, two, three. The three is your rarest characters or weapon cards. Visually, it was easy to tell if you were going to get a mid-tier character or card, or if you were going to get a high-tier character or card. Again, graphically, this could totally change come official release. What I also liked was if ever you decided to skip through the animation sequence, it would show you in full animation characters or cards that you were getting for the very first time. And this is a gotcha game. I know those are not for everybody. So if gotcha games are not your cup of tea, I could totally respect that. But I can say after doing chapter zero and chapter one, it really did feel like a solo campaign action RPG. Like it didn't feel like I was playing a gotcha game. With some time investment, I could have totally finished all the content provided with the starting characters. All right, closing statements. This is a good first impression. As far as feedback goes, obviously for like gotcha system, I hope that they separate the in-game currency for standard and limited banners. The other thing that I'm hoping that is optimized during the development is explaining how the baseball game works. I had a really hard time, especially as the batter. What actions were more beneficial? The tutorial would only say like, keep an eye on your surroundings and send the ball where you want to send the ball, but your statement would also either taunt the pitcher or bring up your morale in your team. It wasn't quite clear. But for some reason, I seem to have had a much better time as the pitcher to strike out the characters. I don't know what it was. I was just, you know, going with my gut instinct and hoping for the best instead of having a structured approach, if you will. The other qualm I had was more because I was rushing the story and kind of getting the most content as possible in a week's time. The qualm was that there were so many enemy encounters and it kind of seemed long to get to the next story checkpoint. This might not be an issue during official release. This might be an issue non-issue because if I took my time to actually build my characters, the fights wouldn't seem so long and tedious and it wouldn't take as long to get to the next checkpoint. Overall, I am looking forward to the full release. I see myself playing this very casually off stream and then doing some story segments on stream. The characters are all very interesting. The plot is compelling. The graphics are gorgeous. Looking forward to the music composition and yeah. If you're not familiar with my Twitch page, I stream most Friday and Saturday evenings as well as Sunday afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. Play a lot of visual novels, RPGs, action adventures, things like that. If I don't see you over there, I wish you a very happy time zone, and we'll catch you next time. Bye!